Hello and welcome to the brand new episode of In Love With The Process. Before I get into today's show, I just want to thank all of you that are listening slash listening, watching this thing on YouTube. Now, look, I want to come out right away and say, I know it may be odd that you're just listening to this show on YouTube. And both Liam and I have gone through the painstaking process of trying to make graphics and uh, visuals on the screen that are interesting to stare at for for hours while you listen to us talk. Um, But I know a lot of you guys are like, hey, why aren't you filming this show yet? We have every intention of doing so, but my philosophy is this. We're still stuck in COVID times, so I don't want to just have another show that is just a couple of Zoom cameras being screen captured. Uh, It's just not interesting to me, and I don't think it will be as interesting to you guys. So I will say this, subscribe to us on YouTube. Do it now. Have this be one of the places that you listen to the show. You can also find the show on Spotify. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts. You can find the show on Stitcher. There are a bunch of different formats for it, but subscribe on YouTube because what's going to happen is we're going to get out of this crazy COVID, crazy lockdown, prison men, or whatever you want to call it, and we're going to start filming the show, okay? So be one of the first to subscribe to us on YouTube, and please do so because here's a little insider information. We can't monetize this show at all until we get at least a thousand followers. Okay? So please just follow us on YouTube. If you're hoping to donate to us, you know, when we ask for donations and we ask for you guys to go through the sponsorships or maybe do the audible trial and you're like, Mike, I just don't have any money. That's fine. You can simply help out the show by subscribing to it on YouTube. That's it. Super simple. It literally doesn't cost you a dime. Like right now, you're listening on your phone. You can actually open up YouTube at the same time, search for In Love With The Process, or go to inlovewiththeprocess.com and click on the Watch Us On YouTube button there. Then click on the subscribe button at our YouTube channel. Just wanted to say that early on for you guys on YouTube. So thanks. So for today's episode, surprisingly, we have never had a producer on the show, like a big producer, like someone that makes the movies that we've grown up loving. Um, And today's episode is going to be a great one because we do. For the first time, we're having a Hollywood producer on the show. I get to ask him the questions that I want to ask as a director. I get to ask him the questions that I know you want to know as a director. And uh, let's just say this right up front. The reason this show is happening today is because of Liam. Liam's hanging out with me now. What's up, Liam? Hello. All right. So how did we get today's guest? Well, we got today's guest because uh, I go to his school, basically. He's the uh, uh, the uh, executive director of Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema. That's right. And that's one of the reasons why you ended up going back East Coast. You were out here hanging out with me and uh, working remotely from your bedroom here in Los Angeles. And uh, you did the big old trip back East Coast. Yeah. um, Funny enough, we had the conversation with uh, Ted Sim. That episode was literally like the day before I had my interview for Fierstein. And uh, Uh. so I was in your I was in your house really kind of stressing out about the whether or not I was even going to go to school, if I was going to get accepted, or uh, if I was going to go to Fierstein. So how's it working now with COVID and all that stuff? Are you, are you Is it remote stuff that you're doing? Or? You know, they say it's remote, and it is. Um, but when all of your school, like your classmates, are in New York, and you're still expected to, you know, produce projects for the classes, you kind of have to still be in New York. So I'm uh, I'm currently in Philly, but in the next two weeks, I'm going to be in New York because I just, it, you have to be there. So Liam pitched me on doing the show and, uh, you know, Liam pitches me on a bunch of ideas and sometimes I listen, sometimes I don't. Right, Liam? <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> um, but uh, he was like, look, I, I, I have access to a great producer on the show. 
uh, and he was like, "Like we can have uh, Richard Gladstein on the show. Now, I know some of you guys listening, some of you guys and girls out there are like, Who, who's Richard? What has he done? Uh, let's just say that he is a two-time Academy Award nominated producer. So if you are someone that needs to have uh, awards or uh, you know, uh, recognition like that in order to validate whether or not you're going to listen. Yeah, okay. Yes, he has been nominated uh, twice for Academy Awards. He has produced such films as The Born Identity, Cider House Rules. He also produced Finding, Never- Finding Neverland. Um, but, okay, for all you nerds out there, more importantly, he has produced and been an executive producer on most of Quentin Tarantino's movies. We're talking Reservoir Dogs, we're talking Jackie Brown, we're talking Hateful Eight, right? We're talking Pulp Fiction, okay? And he was producing and executive producing during the 90s, which is a big time for all these independent film directors that we know and love. 90s is when Robert Rodriguez was found, it's when Kevin Smith was found, it's when Tarantino was found. And we talk about that on this episode. We actually talk about what his experience reading Reservoir Dogs, his experience getting Reservoir Dogs made, right? And I know there's a lot of young directors out there who feel the same way that I felt before I got access to a lot of this stuff, where it's like, who are these producers and how do I get their attention and how do I, how do I get my movies in their laps and are they going to go look at my films in, the, in film festivals? Do short, are short films worth my time? Should I make my short films uh, a mini version of my feature? All these questions I ask a Hollywood producer on this episode. So I'm just gonna say this in the most humble way possible. You're welcome. (laughs) Cause we do it. And this is a great show, a great episode for directors. And I know you guys are gonna be pumped about it. And uh, Richard shares a lot on the show. He talks about his experiences producing these films. We break down the differences between what an executive producer does and what a producer does. All these questions are answered on the show. And Liam, I got to give you credit, brother. This was a good grab, man. This is a good get for today's episode. So thank you. Everybody thank Liam right now. Thank you, Liam. You know, well, look, we we said, right? It's third season. It's bigger and better. We're doing all this stuff. And I'm, I'm trying to deliver just as much as you are. All right. Well, you're doing a killer job, my friend, and you're doing a great job from the East Coast. And stick around for after the show because you fucking hijacked last week's episode. So I have to come on here. We have to talk. I have to give you my input now that I heard all the shit that you were letting out on that show. So I'm going to give it to you at the end of the episode. So stick around for that. And before we get into this, as always, please continue to support the show. Thank you everybody that has been following me on Instagram at Mike Petchy at Instagram or the podcast on Instagram at in love with the process pod. That's in love with the process. Say it with me, P O D on Instagram there. I've been posting all sorts of new stuff. We've been giving some behind the scenes footage that I really enjoy. Um, we were selling our t-shirts and big boo hoo to everybody that didn't get their t-shirt on time. I'm going to say this right now. If you saw my stuff this morning, I posted, what is today? Today's the 21st. This morning I posted all those t-shirts being screen printed, right? Remember when I was saying, get your shirts? Well, you didn't get them in time. They were limited runs. So the people that did get them, you have a limited version of those t-shirts. You're one of the few that gets it. Now, for some of you late to the party, some of you who are like, Mike, stop giving me so much shit. I just showed up. I didn't know you had fucking t-shirts. Uh-huh, I gotcha. Because I ordered a bunch of extras, personally ordered a bunch of extras. So that means I'll probably be giving some shirts away. Okay. And you know, if you know, if you've been listening, if you've been watching my films, you know, I don't give shit away for free. You're probably going to have to do something for it. Right. That may be subscribing to our email list. That may be writing a review for one of the movies. Be prepared. But I'm telling you. I'm going to be showing off my t-shirts. The people that bought the t-shirts are going to be showing them off. You are going to be so butthurt that you didn't get one. (laughs) All right. So anyways, also, if you are new to the show, if you just showed up and you found this link and you're like, oh my God, producer's going to tell me how to make my movies. And then you showed up and you're here now. 
go and listen to the older episodes. Go to inlovewiththeprocess.com. There I've curated the show based upon subject material. So if you're a young director and you're like, I just want to listen to director's episodes, it's all there for you. If you're like, holy shit, I didn't realize that you interview like barbecue chefs and chefs like that, it's there for you too. So if you go to inlovewiththeprocess.com, get everything that you need in one place. All right, Liam, have I talked enough? Should we get on with the show? Yeah, absolutely. You wanna, you wanna, you wanna send us off? Sure. So, if you're ready, if you're excited, I need everybody to uh, put on those noise canceling headphones, sit back, relax, and enjoy this producer's episode of In Love with the Process. Spoken like a true robot, Liam. Thank you. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. <laughs> Richard, thanks for being on the show, my friend. My great pleasure. Uh, very excited. We were just talking off air about this, that uh, you are the first producer for our show. Surprisingly, it's been 100 episodes and we haven't had a producer on yet. <laughs> so I'm the sacrificial virgin lamb. <laughs> yes, we'll make it painless, <laughs> quick and painless. <laughs> Thank um, you. So <clears throat> to catch the audience up a little bit, on uh, on who you are and what you've done. You've been producing films for, for years now and have produced some of, I know some of my favorite movies, but I guarantee you uh, everybody listening to the show has seen almost all of your films. Um, how, did you, how did you get started as a producer? Let's see. Um, I think producers come from all sorts of different um, angles, if you will, and different... Um, Backgrounds. I went to film school at Boston University, which, oh, cool. which was a little bit more um, theory and criticism as opposed to production. Mm -hmm. and, and then I worked various kinds of jobs as a production assistant and, um, you know, then in the mail room. And then I went a little bit more into the kind of acquisitions area as this, things like the Sundance Film Festival and the independent film world started to um, become more vital in the sort of nineties, if you will, eighties. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. I feel old. And, um, I went more into the sort of acquisition side. And then, um, after doing that for a few years, I wanted to, um, I wanted to produce. And so in the mid, I would say in the mid nineties, I, I formed my own company and just started producing on my own. And I've been doing that ever since. Um, well, let me just first by, start by saying, like, you're not old. I'm in that same time period, man, so it's fine. <laughs> and the, the 90s was such a fascinating time for independent film at that point, right? Because that's where, uh, you know, you had the, the, the come-ups of um, Sundance and all the film festivals, and then uh, directors basically being plucked from film festivals. So you have, like, the Kevin Smiths, you have the Quentin Tarantinos, you have all those folks. Um, so it was pretty crazy. I mean, now looking back on it, it's, it seemed like it was a pretty exciting time, but you were living in it. How, how was it at that time period? Um, it was great. I mean, in a way, the what's happening in today's world with the sort of um, the interest in things on Netflix mm -hmm. and interest in things on Amazon and um, limited series um, that are on is akin to what the sort of independent film movement was in the 90s it felt as fresh. So um, watching stuff on Netflix now, these kind of documentaries or these series or Chernobyl on HBO, which was amazing, I, I yeah. it was a really good series. Um, I think that that is akin to what the independent film movement was in the eighties and nineties um, yeah. is that it's essentially dramas, you know, you know, sexualizing videotape or reservoir dogs or, the mm -hmm. crying game or um, the piano or um, uh, uh, that that's that sort of movement of sort of auteur voice, if you will, um, mm -hmm. uh, was what was 
it wasn't founded in the nineties because you had a generation before that with, with people like, you know, John Cassavetes, et cetera. And yeah. the films of the seventies, there was a similar sort of movement, if you will. So it's not like the nineties it was born, but I think, um, it just evolved the way that Netflix, et cetera, is evolving today. It's just a different generation. Yeah. Fascinating. And, um, <clears throat> when you started, um, when you started getting into producing, because look, a lot of the folks listening to the show are young directors and people that are trying to get movies up and running, uh, and I myself have been that for years, uh, and I'm excited to have you on the show because A, of the education stuff that you've been doing lately, and B, because of the experience that you have, and uh, for a lot of young directors, producers, especially like Hollywood producers and people that have done larger movies, they're essentially these mythical creatures that were trying to get their attention <laughs> and, uh, you know, trying to get in with uh, a great producer, get in with someone that's going to support your film and your vision and make it happen. In the beginning, when you, because you've done, have you done all of Tarantino's movies? Have you produced all of his films? No, I was involved with four of his, I think, nine. Um, so I did, um, his first, I was a producer of his first three movies, which was Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, and Jackie Brown. Oh, wow. Yeah. Talk and about then, a good list. <laughs> and I, I recently did um, The Hateful Eight. Yeah. And dude, The Hateful Eight was so fantastic, by the way. Such a, a an amazing experience, such a really great theater experience. And there was a lot of, I guess there was a lot of risk in, in, in releasing it the way that it was released, right? With the, uh, specifically looking for theaters that could only carry IMAX and doing the release like that. Wasn't it difficult? Well, it's actually even more complicated than that. It wasn't IMAX. It was 70 millimeter, which right, IMAX right, and 70 right. millimeter are two completely different technologies. But essentially, like IMAX, um, you can um, shoot in IMAX or you can sort of reconfigure your movie to kind of play in IMAX. Um, mm -hmm. So it's sort of like poor man's IMAX, if you will. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, what we did was we shot our film in 70 millimeter and we initially projected it in 70 millimeter. So actually 65 millimeter, but whatever. So <laughs> in essence, the, the, the negative is twice the size. Um, so that makes for a uh, layman's answer would be like a, 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 a clearer, more vivid, um, not necessarily clearer, more vivid, but a bigger image that you're starting with a bigger canvas. Um, yeah. so you have more detail. You probably have more grain too, but you have more more detail in the in the image. So it was shot on sixty five millimeter, and we 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 didn't find theaters that could show it because there really weren't very many. We actually built the theaters to be able to do it, a hundred of them. Yeah, to be able to project it in that format, and then shortly thereafter, a few weeks later, then it it went out like a normal movie on thirty five millimeter and digital. Um, which now today, you know, 98% of the theaters just show digital. You're not actually watching film. You're watching a digital copy of the movie. Yep. Yep. Uh, and you just don't know it or maybe you do, but, um, <laughs> not film anymore. You're not, you're going to watch a film, but you're not watching a film. You're watching a digital. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm kind of an idiot for, for, uh, forgetting the terminology of what it was because I actually, uh, it's funny that you went to BU because I grew up in Boston and I was a Boston filmmaker um, for years. And I, when you guys screened uh, The Hateful Eight, I knew the projectionist over at the Coolidge Corner. So I got to go up and actually see the film. I actually saw like stills of the film in the projection booth and watched him run it. Oh, cool. um, and yeah. that is such a such a forgotten craft, the, the actual craft of being a projectionist and Oh, did they have that huge platter where you, you see the film on that big pancake of a platter that's like the size that's of insane. you know, it's yeah. like it's the size of like a huge jacuzzi. <laughs> it's the size of the platter, which is it didn't even fit into some projection but it's if you, if you strung all the film together. Um, so uh yeah, so did you used to go to the Rat Skeller in Kenmore Square? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Yeah, man. Yeah, years and years. And I love Boston. Boston is really good for me. And uh, that city, um, as far as filmmaking is concerned, there's, there's actually such a great industry there of technicians and really talented crew people. And 
um, I was able to do my, my two proof of concepts there and it's a wonderful city to, to flex your muscles as far as the director is concerned. So we filmed, um, I was, I produced a movie called the cider house rules and we shot in, uh, in, uh, New Hampshire and yep. Vermont, and we pulled a lot of sort of Boston crew cause it was so close. Um, and we filmed in Northampton mass. Um, yep. but, and so we pulled from that community a little bit. Yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're a salty community <laughs> and there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of them listening and, you know, dealing with their unions out there can be interesting, but, um, there's a lot of really talented technicians and a lot of really smart people out there. So, um, and have very loyal crews. So it's, uh, one of my favorite places to shoot. Cool. Um, so moving on a little bit. So how did you end up meeting Tarantino? Like, how did you guys start that relationship? How did, how did you get into that process with him? I worked for a, a, a company called live entertainment, um, which was a home video company. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, this is in the late eighties. And at that time, um, the, the, what was considered the video business it was sort of the birth of the DVD business shortly thereafter. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, that market started to explode of being able to go to Blockbuster and get a movie or, you know, your own, like the mom and pop video store at that point. Mm -hmm. So the home video um, rights to a movie was about the most lucrative. So home video companies like Live Entertainment or, uh, or RCA Columbia or Vestron, if you will, th these companies were largely responsible for financing a, a, quite a lot of independent films because that that distribution right was worth so much money. So basically I worked at this company doing acquisitions and production and uh, it was my job to find the films for us to finance. And we normally financed half of a film and mm -hmm. take the US rights and, and the producer would have to go find the other money from international. And that's the way we, we sort of ran our business. And we would just sort of cause a lot of movies to get made because of the revenue stream that came from home video. So that's what we were doing. And I, I, so it was my job to sort of find the movies for us to do. And I would buy finished movies um, at film festivals. I would buy finished movies from Miramax at the time. I would buy finished movies from all sorts of people. And we would end up making, you know, five or 10 movies a year. And, mm -hmm. um, so when I was making a sequel to a horror movie called silent night, deadly night, mm -hmm. this director named Monty Hellman, um, Monty Hellman was sort of cult director in the sixties and he directed one of these silent night, deadly nights. And he sent me the screenplay for reservoir dogs. Oh. And, um, that's why he's an executive producer with me on the movie. Yep. And, uh, uh, when I read it, I, I sort of flipped out over it. No one knew who Quentin was, you know, as everyone knows, he was working in a video store. <laughs> and, um, uh, he lived in this little studio apartment on Laurel Canyon Drive. Uh, mm -hmm. And nobody knew who he was. I didn't know who he was. Um, but I loved the script. And so I, I was able to convince live entertainment to uh, commit the money to finance the whole of the movie. Um, wow. as, opposed to the, as opposed to half, because I was so kind of obsessed with the screenplay. <laughs> and um, and we, I, I think we were shooting three months after I read it. Yeah, I was so into it. Um, and that led to us selling the movie as a finished film to Miramax Films, mm -hmm. to distribute. And then shortly thereafter, I went to work at Miramax Films as their head of production. And the first movie that we made there was... Pulp Fiction at wow. Miramax. So it was the first movie that I said, you know, I really want us to make this movie. It's Quentin's next movie that he gave me the script, you know, before other people. And, or I thought before other people, actually a lot of other people had it in the past. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, uh, and so that was the first movie that we made when I went to work at, at Miramax. Pulp Fiction. Wow. That's a good, that's a cool, that's a really, I mean, you must be really a excited, but also proud to be part of the, if not one of the major reasons why it, the, his movie started and got started to get financed. I mean, essentially 
finding that initial financier, especially as a first time director, because I deal with this, like getting over that hump, like getting past development and getting over that hurdle and getting the ball rolling is the hardest part with any feature film. Um, and trying to find that initial capital, trying to find that money to get you to a movie going is like, it's a nightmare. <laughs> well, one of the things that, that uh, uh, when I got the script from Monty, um, uh, that helped distinguish it slightly is like, we would always have to sort of look at what is the package? Who's the director? Who's the producer? What's mm -hmm. the screenplay? Do we like the screenplay? Um, also, what are the actors that we might cast or what are the actors that you already have that are interested and when i read it i read it knowing that harvey keitel wanted to be in the movie mm -hmm. at that time he didn't know which part he wanted to play uh, but he wanted to be in the movie so when i read it i had he, they already had him you know somewhat attached to to it um and you know we sort of firmed that up as we went along and then we actually tried for a moment to cast the movie with bigger actors and make it at a bigger budget and, and that the level actors would be, um, you know, more like the sort of like Chris Walkins and Dennis Hoppers and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we, we went about sort of uh, uh, starting to try to cast the movie that way at a, at a little bit of a higher budget. And we didn't immediately get met with the success that we wanted. So we lowered the budget and we just said, let's just do it with, let's pay everybody basically scale um, and cast it however we want without mm -hmm. necessarily a requirement of having the name value of a Christopher Walken or Dennis Hopper or um, can't remember the other people we were considering. But, and uh, at that time, you know, Tim Roth and Steve Buscemi and, um, Michael Madsen, you know, these were not necessarily people who had been in a lot of other movies. I mean, right. I've been in a few. Quentin knew who they were, but he was about the only person who knew who they were. <laughs> it's it's fascinating. I mean, because that's the it's the whole chicken or egg thing when you're when you're trying to get a movie off the ground. And a lot of time, you know, like you were saying, like having a cast when you read that script and knowing that Harvey Keitel was in that thing, that must have made that read uh, a lot more interesting for you and a lot more easier to sort of vision or be able to see visualize because of that. Correct. Not really actually, because, um, you know, it, I, I don't think it takes a vast imagination to imagine an actor like Harvey Keitel or Chris Walken or any of these guys, uh, kind of in some ways your imagination is better than the reality. So you're imagining different people. Um, and, you know, that's the beauty of a screenplay is that you bring yourself to it. And mm -hmm. if you know who all the actors are, it, it might not color it in the best way. Um, uh, because what you want to read is that character on the page, not necessarily that actor in the part. So, okay. you know, in, you know, what, one of the really interesting things as, as you probably know, when you, you probably read a lot of screenplays, mm -hmm. it's inevitable, no matter how well, written the screenplay is that you get to a, a certain point and you see that there's this character named bill or john whoever debbie you know says something and you go wait a minute who's debbie and then you have to go back a couple pages because uh, you perhaps skimmed over who the introduction of debbie and mm -hmm. oh, wait which one is debbie again oh she was 20 pages ago which one was she you know <laughs> and you have to like inevitably that happens when you read anything, you read a newspaper article, like you get five paragraphs and you go, wait a minute, what, who is that? And then you go back and you, with Quentin's screenplays, the way that they're written, and even with Reservoir Dogs, who basically the characters were Mr. Blue, Mr. Black, Mr. Brown, Mr. they didn't have names, um, Mr. White, and you never had to go back and wonder who was who, because they were so distinctly who they were that you never were confused. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. White, which guy is that? Oh, he's the guy who came in after. Oh, he's <laughs> yeah, the right. guy, oh, Mr. Pink. Oh, he was the guy who didn't tip in the beginning or was he the guy who, you never had to, you always remembered who, because they were so well articulated and drawn, their characters were so specific. Yeah. That you didn't go, wait a minute, which guy said that? Or, or wait a minute, who's the son of the boss? Is it nice guy Eddie or is it that guy or is it like, you just remembered because 
they were so distinct from one another. Yeah. 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 It's, that's a, that's an important little nugget there because there's a lot of screenwriters that listen to the show as well. And I, one thing that I've learned from uh, my writing partner and he's been writing screenplays for a few years now, and he's been doing some larger stuff at Hollywood and I, by no means am I a great screenwriter. I'm a director. So uh, luckily I was able to team up with this guy who it is his craft. And the one thing I've learned from him is it isn't just about coming up with a great idea. It's not just about uh, putting a good movie down on the page, but it's actually writing a screenplay so that it's fast. It's a fast read. It's a simple read. You can understand who the characters are, like he said. Um, and it's also about being able to craft emails that that get people excited about reading the script. And so there's a whole craft around putting out a script and producing a script and making a script from a screenwriter's uh, perspective that really helps a movie get made. And I've heard, I, I, I've never read uh, Reservoir Dogs, but I've read a couple of other Tarantino scripts and he definitely has that distinctive, exciting voice that when you get into it, you just, it gets you revved. I mean, it's, I can't imagine. Uh, well, he's, he's also, he's evolved. What, what's really interesting is um, in the beginning with uh, Reservoir Dogs and then Pulp Fiction, say, there's very, very little description that he writes as the screenwriter mm -hmm. for those characters in those scenes. So in Reservoir Dogs, it says, in the beginning, it says five, you know, five guys, black ties, white shirts, sit around in a diner. <laughs> and then they'd start talking. Okay. And there is no description of, you know, it's early morning, they're having breakfast, and this guy's upset, and he looks like this, and he has a <laughs> beard, and he's old. There is none of that. Mm -hmm. No description whatsoever that the writer is giving the reader. You have to glean everything by what people say and do, by their behavior and their dialogue. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, but in the latter scripts, he started to become more, forgive the expression, writerly. And he <laughs> would write these long, really wonderful descriptions of things that, and a completely different style, that he as the screenwriter is telling the reader. And that informs the script in a completely different way for the reader. Fascinating. And, and so I remember in, um, I was going to do, uh, I was going to do kill bill. Mm -hmm. And, but I was off doing it. I went off to do these other movies that I was doing and I, I wanted to produce my own stuff and not be executive producer of his movie so much. So I, but I had read the script and we were talking about it and, uh, uh, and if I didn't have these other movies to do, of course I would have done it, you know, but I had these, I can't remember what it was that I was doing, but whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, uh, there was this description of in Kill Bill, I'll never forget it. Cause I, I was laughing out loud um, <laughs> in juxtaposition to what I just said about Reservoir Dogs, four, you know, six guys sit around black shirts, white ties in a diner eating. And then they just start talking. Right. Uh -huh. No more description about anything, right? In Kill Bill, there would be pages of description. And there was one that said, the bride walks down the hallway. She creeps down the hallway, um, you know, gingerly, tentatively. She's nervous. She's this. And, uh, we, and then it literally says in the screenplay something like, now, we know that Bill is behind that door over there. Okay. <laughs> But the bride, par parenthetical, Uma Thurman doesn't know this. But actually, Uma Thurman does know this because she read the script. So <laughs> she's such a good actor that she's not going to let you know that she knows that Bill's behind that door over there. But we know that she knows, but the bride doesn't. More importantly, the bride, her character, doesn't know that Bill's behind that door. And it's so funny. <laughs> That you're reading, like, and this is the writer talking to you, which is, you know, not what normally happens in a screenplay. Now, yeah. of course, the writer is always talking to you in the screenplay, right? But this kind of overt, like, bust the fourth wall thing is not your norm. But Quentin can do it just because, like, you get there and you're like, are you crazy? You're talking to me, like, not as the screenplay. You're like... 
you're telling me this as like the writer and you're talking about Uma, not the bride. It's crazy. <laughs> Uh, must make reading his scripts fun, though. <laughs> it's completely enter- it's so entertaining. But you know that's the one of the mistakes that a lot of young writers make is that if if you start your screenplay and it says you know, uh, in walks Mike recently divorced and broke. How do we know that Mike is recently divorced and broke? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen it. <laughs> well, I don't know that. You just told me that in the screenplay. So that's I, when I'm watching the movie, I'm not going to know he's recently divorced and broke. Yeah. You just told me that in the screenplay. That's called cheating. <laughs> exactly. You know, and it, it's funny because you, you don't realize that until you've done it enough. Like you start working on movies and there's that old saying like show don't tell. Um, and as a director, you start to sort of wrap your head around that where it's like, it's more powerful to see someone do something. It's more powerful to see someone make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in, in the mindset that they're in than it is to have someone else sit there or have them explain to you, like, I am really pissed off. I've had a really shitty day. I'd rather see them try to go through their day and put the clues together myself and go, fuck, that guy's had a rough time. Well, it's one thing to say he aggressively makes a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah. But it's another thing to say he aggressively makes a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because his wife just dumped him. How do we know the wife just dumped him? We don't know that. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> Okay, guys and girls, you know the deal. It's time to take a break uh, from all that free knowledge that we've been giving you on today's episode. How fucking cool is this one, right? Um, so right now is that is that time. It's that moment to give the thanks to the men and women that support the show. And I'm not just talking about you guys at home, but I'm talking about the sponsors. Now, before you go, oh, fuck, this is where I fast forward to the ad reads. Uh, you might not want to do that because I might actually give you some shit that you want You know what I mean? It's not all advertisements here, guys. Um, So first and foremost, let's just say there's a bunch of ways to support the show. So you can go to inlovewiththeprocess.com. If you go to inlovewiththeprocess.com, there is a sponsor section. There's a sponsors tab on top where you can donate. There's a donate button so you can donate whatever you want to the show. And I know it's a tough thing right now to ask for donations from you guys because a lot of us are dealing with unemployment. A lot of us are dealing with the uncertainty of work. I completely understand. There are a bunch of ways to support the show without it costing you anything. You can sign up if you haven't done so already. You can sign up for the Audible 30-day free trial, right? So you go to, I think it's audible.com backslash in love with the process. The link will be below, Liam. I always forget what it is. Um, And if you go there, you sign up for a 30-day free trial. Here's what you get. One, you get a free audiobook, right? That's a big thing. Two, you get access to all Audible's uh, audio content. So I'm on Audible right now, and I didn't realize that with my membership, I also got access to a bunch of like really interesting narrative podcast series. There's like a really interesting one on aliens. There's all sorts of like really sort of genre-based stuff that's kind of cool. Um, and then. Once you sign up for that stuff, we get paid. As long as you haven't done it before on another podcast, you sign up, they pay us for it. Now, stick around for the 30 days. You're probably gonna wanna stick around longer than that because there's so much content to consume on there. But if you can't afford it, you just want the 30 days for free, no big deal for us. We still get paid either way. And I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you guys that, but they've never really canceled us on that, so fuck this. That's essentially what the deal. So if you want to get us some money, without costing you a dime, you haven't done so already, go to inlovewiththeprocess.com, click on the Sponsors tab, or the link below the episode, and sign up for the Audible free trial. Makes sense, right, Liam? Yep. (laughs) Yep. Uh, There's a bunch of other ways to support the show. We have some deals with Capital One, where you can uh, sign up for a Capital One Venture Card or Venture One Card, and anybody that signs up that has good credit, and I'm not going to tell you guys to do this if you don't know how to manage your finances, right? If you don't know how to manage your finances, if you're someone that is up all night spending way too much money on Amazon because you're trying to make yourself feel better, don't listen to me on this, please. But if you're someone that is starting a business, if you're someone that needs to have credit, if you're 
someone that wants to make sure that you have, you're not tapping into your rent money to get gear, then go check it out. Check out one of our deals from Capital One Venture, Adventure One. They give you a bunch of really great rewards for signing up, a bunch of really great rewards for spending a certain amount of money, um, and you get travel points and everything else. It's fantastic. That's how Gina and I were able to afford to move across country when we did, is that we uh, saved up a lot of our points using the Capital One cards. So check it out. Uh, also up, good buddies over at Puget Systems. If you are a video editor, if you're a video gamer, um, you know, who else would use a Puget Systems, Liam? Uh, uh, 3D artist. There you go. 3D artist, you know. If you're someone that is just really bummed out because your porn videos are loading too slowly. <laughs> yeah, maybe, I already said a 3D artist. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's time you got your hands on a new computer. And I know, I know that 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 initial shock when you go over to one of the bigger manufacturers' websites. Let's say maybe uh, fuck them, Apple. Maybe it's Apple's website, and you go there and you look at the price tag on that, and then you're spending the rest of the afternoon trying to wash the taste of vomit out of your mouth. It's because they're way overpriced. It's ridiculous the markup that you get on those systems. And a lot of that has to do with marketing. A lot of that has to do with branding. A lot of that just has to do with the fact that they have a cult and they've convinced everybody in that cult to spend that kind of money. They will never sponsor this show after all my terrible reads for them. Um, here's what I did. I was in that same position. I was running a post-production company and I needed new machines because for some reason, the last update for software rendered all my hardware useless and it was completely irritating. So I looked and hunted for a computer manufacturer that I could rely upon that makes uh, affordable machines and that has a living, breathing customer support system. And I found Puget Systems. So Puget, system, Puget Systems builds amazing editing PCs. <gasps> Holy shit! He said PCs, Liam. I said a fucking PC. Can you believe that shit? I don't know who you are anymore. Yeah, so it's crazy, right? It's a whole new world. You can actually edit on PCs. And PCs don't crash all the time. This isn't the 90s, guys. This isn't pre-2000s. Uh, you can find a great PC that's affordable and upgradable that works specifically for the programs that you need and specifically uses hardware that makes those programs run, run twice as fast. Oh, man, I'm doing a long read for these guys because I love them. Go to PugetSystems.com. There you can choose a system based upon the software you use. And here's the thing. They will suggest baseline systems to you, but they love to talk to their clients. They love artists. They support artists. They've been supporting the show. They've supported who's there. Um, they will help you build a custom PC based upon your budget and price, okay? And I know that there's a lot of listeners from Australia listening to us. We have big listeners. Do you know the countries offhand, Liam? We got big listeners from fucking UK, Australia. Bunch um, of I don't know them offhand, but yeah, there's a bunch in Europe. There's a bunch in uh, Southeast Asia. Like, we got a, everybody, man. Well, those folks are listening right now going... Uh, but I'd like to order Puget System, but they don't ship internationally. Well, here's what they've done. They've started a program there, which basically is a consultation program. So you can pay them a small fee. I think it's like $500, which is nothing. They will walk you through the hardware you need to build the Puget Systems on your own. Not bad, especially if you're someone that's trying to build your own PC right now. And you're like, what hardware works with what? I can't figure out why this memory is not working with this motherboard. And I don't understand these things. I'm telling you, if you want to be a good video editor and you need to know how your machine works, you need to know how the engine runs, go to PugetSystems.com. They're a perfect resource for all those different things. I love you guys. Um, also up, good friends over at Quasar Science. I just talked to them yesterday and they're hooking me up with a bunch of new lights and gear. Quasar makes amazing LED technology. LED light units. And I know a lot of you guys out there living in this world right now where it's like, oh, of course, LED, LED's everything. Well, it hasn't always been everything. Prior to this, you were dealing with lights that drew a lot more power. You needed bigger circuits for them, right? How many of you guys in film school, you've done this, Liam, right? You plugged in too many lights into a circuit before? 
Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, man. What happens? <laughs> there are no lights. Yeah, and a child dies in the house next door. No. <laughs> Pretty no. much. <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't realize that in your normal house circuit, your normal home circuit, most circuit uh, or most breakers are set up with like 15 amp circuits, right? Maybe a 20 amp circuit. And so if you're using old tungsten lights, and I love tungsten units because they have a very specific look, but if you're using like a 1K, you won't even be able to plug in a 2K. If you're using a 1K, a 650, you can only plug in a certain amount of lights into that 15 amp circuit. And so when you're, when you're lighting a scene or if you're doing an interview, let's say that you're a videographer doing an interview and you want that three point lighting setup, uh, you, you, you're starting to spread that out over different circuits. You have to because you're going to blow the circuit itself. And maybe you've only put two lights on there and someone in the kitchen just turned on a microwave and blew the whole fucking thing. So one of the cool things about LED tech is that it uses such small amounts of power to put out a large amount of light uh, with a lot of like um, Quasar Sciences bicolor LED units or their rainbow LED units. A lot of these things can be run off a battery. They barely take any power and they put out such a crazy amount of light. And you've seen me use these in my projects. So if you saw the Zarface video that I did with Tom Segura, um, that was all lit with quasars. If you uh, looked at the um, Dale Strong pieces that I did with the knives and the light moving over the knives, that was just me waving a, a, a quasar unit over those as well. And because the lights don't put out a lot of heat as far as temperature is concerned, I can actually hold them and move them around, which is very valuable when you're lighting for the first time someone's face, because I don't know if you noticed this, Liam, but everybody's faces are different. Have you ever noticed that being a robot? <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> flesh looks all the same to me. <laughs> um, but dependent upon how deep someone's eyes are set, dependent upon how big their forehead is, dependent upon where their cheekbones lie, uh, just the subtlest movement in the position of that lighting will either make them look like a monster or make them look amazing. Uh, and oftentimes, you won't know this until you get them in there. And uh, you've seen this before, maybe you haven't, on sets where they actually have stand-ins. They'll have someone come in and stand in so that the lighting team can actually spend like 40 minutes lighting a subject without interrupting the actor's process, right? So they, they try to cast somebody that has similar bone structure. They try to cast someone that has similar hair color, similar height, all these different things. Because down to the millimeter, down to the inch, there's a huge difference in how light plays on someone's face and how it sort of wraps over that landscape. Now, how does this come to Quasar? Well, what I love about Quasar tubes is that I can put somebody in front of that camera and I can literally handheld that tube and move that tube in all different directions and see the different characters that play on that person's face and then you start to learn and start to put these things in your toolbox you know like if i'm going to put the light here this adds a little bit more suspense to this person if i'm going to put the light here that adds a lot more romance to their thing and a lot more uh, uh sexual appeal to them by putting it there it's fascinating stuff and being able to do that with a small handheld, very lightweight, uh, very color reliable unit, like Quasar Science stuff, it's important. So when folks ask Mike, what kind of lights do you have in your kit? I've got a bunch of Quasar stuff. So go to quasarscience.com and check it all out. Uh, let's see, what else? What else do we have for sponsors? Like I said at the beginning, there's that Audible trial. Definitely sign up for that. That'll give us some cash. That'll help us out. Um, oh, you know, I also wanted to give I want to give a shout out, right? I want to give a shout out to one of my buddies in this industry. And I want to give a, a, like a, a great shout out to a fellow podcaster, fellow content creator, to a fellow director. Uh, we uh, think very similarly. I think he is very talented to the point where we even made two short films about the same subject material. I'm not going to say that I did mine first, but we did, um, and uh, I love his show. I love his stuff, I love his podcast, and I definitely want to give it out a shout. Shout out to Ryan Conley and the dudes over at Film Riot. Now, if you haven't listened to Film Riot yet, go do so, look it up, look up his podcast, um, and check out his 
Uh, I don't know if he releases weekly, Liam. Is he always releasing weekly? Do you know? Uh, podcasts, definitely not. They're trying to get there, but definitely not. And then episodes, they're getting close to weekly, but, you know, it kind of fluctuates. But also, like, if you haven't heard about Film Riot, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> get on that. <laughs> definitely check him out. I think it's just filmriot.com, I mm-hmm. think. And then uh, if you look at his stuff on YouTube. Um, he's such a great dude. I was lucky enough to ha- be on his show. He's been on my show. If you haven't heard that episode, it's hysterical. I forget what number that is, Liam. But it's back. Before I got here, or else it would be one of my favorite fucking episodes ever. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we both give each other shit for making the same kind of short film. Um, and I just talked to him the other day, or a week ago, or a change ago. And we were just texting about the industry and talking about stuff. And I was like, dude, I love your fucking show. You know? And so I just want to make sure that my listeners are his listeners too. So, like I said, Go check him out. Go to Film Riot and uh, have fun. And tell him that I sent you, right? Leave comments and be like, yo, Mike did his movie first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, enough fucking rambling. I know you want to get back to Richard and all of the cool new things he's going to teach you about. So I'll shut up right now. <laughs> So <clears throat> talking about, let's, let's talk a little bit about producing. Let me ask a couple technical questions just because I think a lot of folks look at titles or look at uh, credits on a movie screen and they just don't understand. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, and and the, one of the things that I love about this show is that we've been able to talk about like, what is a key grip and actually get into that? Um, what is the difference between being an executive producer and being a producer on a movie? Um, well, it varies. So, and it varies from TV show to movie. So let's just do a movie. Um, yep. So uh, on a film, the executive producer is either a financier or very often you, the producer gives the, the line producer the credit of the executive producer mm. um, because they've done a lot and they're a really good line producer. So it, it can mean either one. Got it. Got it. And then so if, if you're an executive producer, you're really trying to pull together either the cash or pull together the resources that will help you get the cash and bring all that sort of financing no. in, correct? No. So not really. So on a feature film, when you see executive producer, it's either someone who gave some money. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh, and probably wasn't around all that much. Or they might be the executive at a small company like the way I was with with. Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. I was an executive at those financing companies. Mm -hmm. Um, Or like in the case of The Hateful Eight, where I was producer, the executive producer was also the the line producer, the physical logistics producer, who's dealing with every day the budget and the trucks and the signing of the checks and the hiring the crew and the, the very like logistical, physical aspects of making a movie. So the physical, logistical where the trucks park, the cost report, the accounting people, you sometimes give that person executive producer credit um, uh, or co-producer or line producer. It's all the same thing. Or it's someone who gave up some money or it's a, a, a a really good friend of the court, so to speak, um, like Monty Hellman on Reservoir Dogs. Got it. Got it. Got it. So then the, the, the producer producers doing all the heavy lifting as far as like trying to find the financing and trying to do all that sort of stuff. The producer who, the person who gets produced by credit, Mm -hmm. the person who, first of all, if the movie was got nominated for an Academy award, it's only the produced by credit that gets nominated. So, Mm -hmm. um, on, uh, so that's the person who has likely found the material, developed the material, Worked right. with the director. Worked. That is largely the the responsible party for the whole movie. So, when I was executive producer of Pulp Fiction, um, I wasn't around every day. Um, the movie got nominated for Best Picture. I wasn't nominated. Right. 
right? The producer Lawrence was nominated. Okay. Mm -hmm. On my other movies like the cider house rules or Neverland, I was producer and I found those pieces of material, developed them. And so I was nominated. Mm. So, uh, uh, now the distinction would also be on television shows. Mm -hmm. The, just to confuse people even more, (laughs) where where you see like 20 producers on a television show. Mm -hmm. uh, The reason for that is that they give a a lot of the writers producer credit to just avoid residuals. So Uh. basically the, the credit that really matters with TV is executive producer. That's usually the more creative responsible party on a television show is the executive producer. And the producer on a television show is usually like a logistical kind of thing. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. I mean, television's different anyways. Television is more of a writer's medium as opposed to film being a director's medium, right? Isn't that the thing? Television is more, uh, uh, the writer plays a much bigger um, role and serves also in a casting and capacity and in a more of a creative process while the thing is being made when mm-hmm. the writer of a feature film um, is sometimes never even around or they got rewritten or I mean, sometimes they're around sometimes they're not but their role uh, beyond having written it um, in terms of making it and cutting it and marketing it and everything that in in the film world the writer has very little to do with that in TV, the writer has a lot to do with that. They become what's called a showrunner. Right, 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 right. So when you decide that you're going to produce something, like you're actively looking for a film to produce, um, how are you going about your process of looking for the movie? Are you hunting for filmmakers? Are you hunting for material like books and trying to acquire rights for books? Is it, is it a, a plethora of all those different things? Like how do what's your process? Yeah, it's, it's anywhere and everywhere, you know, agents send you stuff, writers send you things, directors send you things. Um, you find things on your own, you, um, read books, magazine articles, you know, sort of anything. Mm. Yeah. And then, um, it's it, it was an interesting thing for me because I got an agent a few years ago. So I'm repped over at UTA and I got management, which as a young as a young director, you're like, okay, cool. Everything fucking changes. Like, this is going to be amazing. And then you get into a whole new game. <laughs> it's a whole new game of insanity with them. Um, do you... Uh, so, like I said, a lot of younger filmmakers are listening to this. Do you think that it's imperative to try to get yourself representation or management if you are a filmmaker or an artist trying to reach a producer or is it is is there still power in film festivals like um i know a lot of younger directors are like uh making short films with the hope that a producer will see a short film but then i've talked to a lot of producers that i work with and they're like we never look at short films in, in, in film festivals like um as a young director trying to get into the business what do you think should be an important priority for them? Well, I think it, you sort of have to do everything, but one has to recognize the fact that um, if, you, if you're at a film festival, it's largely because your film, your short film or your um, feature film is already finished and is playing in the film festival. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you can go to these festivals and meet people as well and you know, sort of you know, pitch your ideas to people but if you're, if you're at a film festival, you know, you've, you've largely succeeded already in the fact that you've probably gotten something made. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's one distinction, but I think, um, making short films is a, is a, uh, is a great way to demonstrate your sensibility and craft. And, um, you know, I think the mistake that a lot of people make is, is, the film that you want to make as a feature, trying to make that as a short doesn't always translate. All right. So one has to decide with a short film, whether or not you're doing a few scenes or whether there's a narrative that has a beginning, middle and end. Um, and a feature film kind of by necessity has to have a beginning, a middle and an end. You mm-hmm. know, if you're Quentin, they can be in different order. <laughs> um, but with a short film, you know, that's 10 minutes long, you know, you, you have to decide what the structure of your, your material is. And I think 
that for me, as a person looking for material and filmmakers, is I'm I'm considerably more attracted to theme than plot. Yeah. So um, the sort of what it's about as opposed to what happens. Um, so uh, I think the mining of thematic relevance, if you will, um, and clarity is something that I am really drawn to. That's really hard to do in a short film. Mm-hmm. Um, but you want to demonstrate your sensibility and acumen in a short film. And, uh, and then utilize that work as a springboard to make something else. It's honestly, it's really nice to hear you say that because that was a a revelation that I came to years and years ago where, you know, you have to get over yourself as a filmmaker because you want to make features, right? You want to get into that position. And and most of the time, the main reason why you're being held back on features is, is usually cash and, and resources just because it takes so long to do them. And sure, you can, there's a hundred different ways you can do them on a low budget. You can always do the Kevin Smith kind of thing, but uh, dependent upon the type of movies that you want to tell, the dependent upon the type of t- t- uh, theme and tone that you want to put on screen, uh, that could be restrictive. And earlier on, I realized that it was more important, like you said, to do um, scenes, to do thematic moments, to actually show my voice, to actually show what I can do as a director, because um, it's so what you were saying earlier, when you when you hand someone a script, someone's going to read that script through their own narr- narration, through their own tone, through their own life experiences, and they're going to process that thing. And I've found since, and I think one of the reasons why I got picked up by uh, uh, UTA was that I was like, look, here are a couple pieces that set my tone. This is what this is what my voice is as a director. This is what makes me an individual as a director. Um, and it's been so useful for me as far as like getting general meetings and getting into spaces where they can just send those pieces. And especially if they're shorter, you can send those pieces, they're a quick watch, and then immediately uh, the producer or the folks at the studio understand your voice and understand your tone. And then if they're reading a script, um, they can process that that way. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And I, I think that that's exactly right. And that's the way to be the most sort of productive. And so like, here's sort of like an interesting example is that when I was looking for um, a director to do um, Finding Neverland, right? mm-hmm. I had developed this script for a really long time. It's in essence, uh, uh, the, it's a period piece set in London. It tells the story of how J.M. Barry came to write Peter Pan is the, <laughs> is the plot. Um, the, uh, it's thematic, um, kind of like, it's really about like where does imagination come from and uh, what, uh, like where do, you, where do you belong and how, can your, how is your imagination triggered? How is your, where do you find inspiration is what the movie's about. And right. It's kind of a kid's movie, right? And... Um, it's told in a very simple kind of child-like way. Um, so, uh, and the, this director who wanted to do it was this guy, Mark. Oh, well, there were a lot of directors as we went through trying to find someone to do it for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, uh, I had met this director, Mark Forrester, and <laughs> he did this movie called Monster's Ball. Mm-hmm. Monster's Ball is kind of like a gritty you know, <laughs> star, you know, uh, rough movie that deals with racism and poverty. And, yeah, dude, it's and, not, it's, you know, it's not, it's not finding Neverland. <laughs> this is, but I, I wanted that director to do Neverland. Why? Right. Uh, because he showed like sort of incredible, like, uh, 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 I, I was afraid that Neverland would be a little sentimentally cheesy. Mm. And, um, and I was also like the way in which he dealt with these kind of like the, the uh, authenticity of human emotion without going over the top mm-hmm. was so recognizable in Monster's Ball that I thought if him doing Neverland is going to take any of the sort of fromage out of the picture. Right. <laughs> and basically because it could have been really ultra sentimental I and mean, it already is sentimental i mean like that's one of the cool things about it is how sentimental it is so like, i don't think sentimental is a bad word like 
containing sentiment is mm-hmm. not a bad thing. It's just whether you you know go extreme close up and watch the person cry into the camera and emote is one thing. Staying a little bit back and letting it build is another way to do it. And and, and that's the way he did it. And mm. I knew that he would do it that way, you know. Uh, and uh, like I remember Johnny Depp going like, "It's the first time I've met someone who's more allergic to emotional cheese than me." <laughs> he goes, he goes like, "I'm allergic to it." He goes, "But this guy is like, he'll die if it comes close to him. Like, like I don't even have to worry about that." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's super cool to, I mean, uh, hopefully if you're a younger uh, director listening to this, there should be a sense of inspiration here. Like basically what we're telling you to do is focus on the reason why you like to make it. Like focus on the craft of, of directing and focus on the skill that you have and the, and the, and the techniques that, that uh, fascinate you the most because in theory, in theory, like the, like you just said, like maybe you do a monster's ball and you get uh, essentially cast to do this other film because they, the producer respects your sentimentality. They they respect your your tone and technique, right? Yeah, and I think also you have to recognize as a producer that you know you like asking directors to repeat themselves. Like they probably don't really want to. Like, yeah. And they probably want to try to do something like slightly different. Yes, they have a certain sensibility, you know, yes. But like, but you, you, you know, you strive to do different work and different tone and different worlds. Um, and, you know, like if, if you wanted Martin Scorsese to direct your movie, like you're going to send him some like Goodfellas gangster movie. I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Like I just like he's probably got a whole bunch of those and he's done it a bunch and like oh. <laughs> like like maybe he'll want to like oh he did Hugo that makes sense you know what I mean right right <laughs> right right I mean because it's the same boat for him how many times how many times does he roll his eyes when he's like oh god I don't want to do this again it's surprising that he came back to that uh, that gangster genre as many times as he did. Yeah, that's why, like, for me, like, uh, I enjoyed watching um, The Irishman. Uh, mm-hmm. like, sort of how can you not enjoy watching those actors and his craft as a director? Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, a lot of people thought that the, the latter part of it, you know, with the sort of aging De Niro um, was the, you know, perhaps the less interesting part of the movie to me, that was the most interesting part. Yeah. I agree with you completely. And the part where I was like slightly restless was, was, you know, we paint houses, don't we? Like, like the, 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 <laughs> the sort of like familiarity of the genre and mm-hmm. the shots and the, I'm like, I've been there a lot with them and I'm like, and I thought it was so fresh and interesting, the sort of, this guy grappling with his legacy and his family, I thought mm. like really an interesting thing that I hadn't really seen. And so I, I really liked the latter part of it. And I was a slightly restless in the beginning part of it. It, it makes sense. It, dude, it makes total sense because you're, you have to sort of ride that line. Correct. If you're dealing with an audience, you're, you're pitching Scorsese, like Netflix is pitching, like the king of fucking gangster movies is coming to Netflix and is doing this amazing movie with the cast of mean streets, with the cast of Goodfellas, with the cast of casino, you know, these people are coming on board to do this. So they have to give you that, uh, that gangster in, they have to give you that formula in. Um, but it's it's with him that he do, he's done it before and even certain aspects of Spielberg movies where he's done it before and there was this whole period in like the late or like uh, 2010s where they had like a longer third act if not like a fourth act a fourth act of their films because they're just getting I, it's like they had to get you in there with a formula and then they're like let me play around a little bit here because I I'm getting restless <laughs> and you can just see it with a lot of these directors you know exactly it's interesting stuff, man. It's interesting stuff. So, um, so at this point, like, when did you decide that uh, education was a big part of your career? When did you decide that you wanted to start giving back to folks? Well, I, I've done a whole, whole bunch of movies. Like, I've produced about thirty movies or so, and um, you know, it gets. I wanted to try to do something 
slightly different. And I think the sort of new generation of filmmakers and storytellers, it, you know, keeps you, keeps you on your toes, so to speak. But also <laughs> I think the, 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 you know, as you can tell from our conversation, like I, I really enjoy talking about films and filmmaking mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I, I feel very passionate ab about it as a craft and as an art, both. And, um, I didn't really go to film school as graduate school. I went undergrad and it was, it was different than it is today. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think one of the things that a film school education offers is, uh, aside from learning the, the art and the craft of how to make a movie is that you really meet a lot of other filmmakers and you learn how to collaborate with others. And yeah. that's sort of like the reason to go to film school, um, is that like, you don't even know it, but you're, you're sitting there meeting people that you will probably work with for the, for a really, really long time. And your work is going to get better and be influenced by those around you. So you could take your money and just go make some films they go mm -hmm. make a short film as opposed to pay for school. But what you get at film school is this sort of uh, uh, melting pot of, of those that are aspiring to make films just like you. And you create this sort of community. And so, um, you know, when I was working at the American Film Institute for a while before my current job, uh, I'm currently working as the executive director of the Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema, which is... Mm -hmm part of Brooklyn college and uh, it's a master's degree program um, where in the various crafts, writing, producing, directing, editing, cinematography, et cetera. And then there's also screen studies and animation, visual effects, and there's scoring and sonic arts. But what um, you, you, you get at these places is the ability to meet other filmmakers. And at, at AFI, for example, I remember um, uh, these two guys, you know, came back to talk to us about their movie. And it was uh, uh, a really cool filmmaker named Darren Aronofsky and a really <laughs> cool um, cinematographer named Maddie Levatique, who does like a lot, does some Scorsese movies now and does all of Darren's movies. They met the first day of film school, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. They still work together. Uh, yeah, and, no, it's true. And like, that's a really, you know, that kind of, it's so like, maybe you will find someone like that who's going to be a collaborator for the rest of your life. But even if you don't, making films is not a solitary enterprise. You can't do it on your own. It's yeah. impossible. Um, so you, you, by necessity, you, they're your crew and, and you're, you're their crew. And you go through this sort of like, you know, rites of passage together and influence each other. And from that is hopefully born your own voice. But that's what you get at film school is this sort of like crazy hyper collaboration. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. And for me, because I went to a, a small film school for a short period of time, and the, the big change for me was that I was coming out of Boston. I was coming out of uh, a city that didn't, it, and this was before they had a tax incentive. So a city that didn't really have an industry and anybody that was in, this, in the city that kind of wanted to get into it, they were sort of half in it. You know what I mean? Like any of your friends that you met, they were like, yeah, maybe I'll do this on the weekends or maybe I'll, I'll, uh, you know, contribute if you do something. But when I went to the school, it was like just the, just the actual task of getting the money and getting the, going to New York and going to a different place and being in that spot, it put me in a whole other mindset where it's like, this has got to be worth it. Every day is going to be worth what I'm doing. And I ended up confronting, um, the, the guys that I went through school with and they were all the same way. Like I just, I came from this place. I came from Indiana. I came from this spot and you end up really diving deep because you have to make the most of the time. Like you've put a lot on the line to get there. So you, you have to spend that time and energy, which is such an important skill to learn as you progress into filmmaking, because it's, it's the same thing every time. It's like 
we finally convinced someone to give us the cash. We finally convinced an actor to be in this thing. And we let's just dive right into it. So it's a the mentality that you learn through that experience, I use all the time on my work. And then as you look back, now I, I look at the guys that I went to school with and like one guy's a producer at NBC, one guy works one of the biggest trailer cutting studios in the industry. Like these people uh, are pushing and, and they're connections at this point. They're friends, but they're also connections that you make. So one, one of the things that also happens in uh, like once you start work, exactly, you know, exactly as you said. So when I was working um, at Miramax in the 90s, um, mm -hmm. all of us, like it was a very tough place to work for obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but one of the things that it did, because it was a very, very difficult um, place to work, and in some ways you could say the morale wasn't always very high. I mean, in some ways the morale was was high because everyone was in a similar position of there were certain discomforts of working there. But mm -hmm. uh, everyone, like, you know, they were all of the assistants and, and the, the, like, you just sort of create this kind of family together. And those people that I worked with in the early 90s, I'm still in touch with all the time. And we have, and they've all gone on and they run, this one runs that studio, this one's had a production at that place, this one's had a production there, this one's been nominated for producing movies, this one. And everyone has sort of like through the trial by fire of being together, you have emerged in a, you know, a way that you have this, this, this uh, bind to one another. And that's what happens at film school as well, I think. You know, that's the environment that, that we're trying to create at Fierstein in Brooklyn. And mm -hmm. um, that's the kind of um, world, the environment that, that I'm trying to help to cultivate. And I, I sort of feel like being a film producer and running a film school, they're kind of similar because, you know, as a producer, what's your job is to unify everyone to mm -hmm. tell the same story, find the resources, tell it well, create the environment for everyone to do their best work. Well, that's just like running Fierstein, I think. That, I'm doing the exact same thing. <laughs> it's, it's like we're all doing this together. This is what our ambition is. This is the environment. Where are we going to spend the money to get the most bang for the buck? We, gotta, we need some more money because we need more. Like I spend money like crazy, right? <laughs> And I have to be like told, like, whoa, whoa, you know, but I'm like, I raise money so that we can spend it. Like, right. I'm not raising it for someone to go redecorate their office. I'm raising it so that, oh, look, we can send a bunch of students out to Skywalker and do a week of sound work there. And, oh, I'm raising this money to bring these people from L.A. here or bring this group of students to L.A. and go on these tours and do this with these people. I'm bringing, you know, uh, uh, I'd like us to be able to shoot and cut some content that we can put out, you know? So all of this kind of, um, I'd like our students to have more scholarship money, right? I'd like to get into more festivals. And, uh, shit, I'll, we'll pay for you to get into those festivals, the, the, the admission fee, the, the application fee, excuse me, you know? Yeah, yeah. And maybe we can even create a little pot of money that we can, we can get you sent there, you know? Uh, because yeah. the, the students at Fierstein, you know, are not the same, don't come from the same background and socioeconomic class as goes to Columbia um, and, or NYU. And it costs a fraction of it. You know, like we, our school costs $20,000 a year. Those schools cost $60,000 a year. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, uh, it, and, it's insane. And we still need scholarship money. But to our community, that 20000 is just like the 60000 to their community. It's the same thing. It's still really expensive. Um, yeah. And yeah. so we got to find ways to make it less expensive, even less than it currently is, even more cheap by other standards. It's not cheap for our community. No, no, no. It makes sense. And it's, it's tough, too, because when you're talking about the film business, because we talk about this on the show all the time, where you go to school or you, you uh, make a movie, or you figure it out, you're basically thrust back into this industry, especially as a young talent you're thrust back into this industry and you're doing a lot of like free work. You're doing a lot of like unpaid stuff. And so it takes a long time for you to recoup 
any sort of investments. And I'm always talking about like gear and everybody's so obsessed with gear and buying new equipment and like, oh, I spent $35,000 on this fucking red camera or something. I'm like, why? Why are you doing all that? Like you're just, yeah. you're stacking. You can, you can um, rent gear. That's the thing. Like, yeah. like what you really need to do is like the, that's the other thing that's I, I find personally a little funky is like people want to know like, so with Netflix now and with Amazon and with Quibi and with, these are just distribution uh, uh, outlets. Mm -hmm. You know, these are just like, that's just like the manner in which your work is displayed. And so, yeah, we need to teach to that a little bit. We need to educate people about what that is. We need to teach to how do you craft stories that are 10 minutes in length and make 10 of them as opposed to one long thing? Yes. But you have to, to learn the art of storytelling and the art of storytelling is similar regardless of how long the episodes are, whether it's, it's Chernobyl again, like I just really like that series. I love that. I love that series too. Uh, 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 you know, whether it's eight hours long or whether it's two hours long or whether it's 10 minutes long, you still have to learn the craft of storytelling and that's the focus. And then mm -hmm. you adapt that knowledge into whatever format or length that you want. But you really have to like mind that what is storytelling and how to tell a story in a unique way. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what turns me on. And then like, you know, and, and in 10 years there won't be Netflix. There'll be something else that we've never heard of. <laughs> right. Like that's, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You just know it's, that's like, that's what is going to happen. Netflix will probably be around, but there'll be something else. Totally, man. And we live in an era right now where it's all about the, we're obsessed or it's because of the marketing, but we're obsessed with the delivery services more than we are with the artists. And there, you know, this with like Spotify, you know, this with Netflix, you know, this with all these different companies where it's all about brand recognition and name recognition. And it's, it, you, you can't lose sight of that stuff. And it's even, I mean, we fall victim to it as, as filmmakers from every direction, whether it's the distribution sort of name branding or if it's the equipment name branding and the gear name branding. Like you're not a fucking professional if you don't have, a, have, have an Apple computer. It's just like none of that fucking matters, man. Like you should be able to tell a story, a structured story that takes the audience through the emotional train that you're trying to set up. You should be able to do that with a candle and fucking shadow play on a wall. Like there, there, there hits a point where we get so convoluted in the commercial uh, world of like uh, basically, basically buying Lamborghinis for gear manufacturers. Well, yeah, where, there's a school of thought also that uh, uh, you know, I mean, one could debate this for for hours, but <laughs> you know, when you you know are starting out and you're just beginning to make your films, like should should you just because you have cranes and and uh, split diopters and all this kind of like crazy gear. Mm -hmm. Should you allow? Sh should you should you have people use that, or should you make limit them in the gear that they have to force them to focus on other aspects of storytelling and not the technical? And <laughs> you could argue that you know really like. One could argue, look, you have that gear sitting in there. I want to check that out. I want to do this shot because I want to tell the story like this. Okay, cool. But you can also say, I'm giving you one lens, mm -hmm. two actors in a room, and you are forced to tell the story with more limited tools. Therefore, you have to focus on other aspects of storytelling that you are unable to convey with greater technology. I completely agree. And I think that... There are some folks that listen to the show that are gearheads that are just like, yeah, but that's not fun. And it's like, okay, look, it's not the sexiest route, but you have to remember that when you get on a film set, you're shooting on a film set, it's completely fluid consistently. And so there may be days where something happens that's completely beyond your control. Like I've, I've told the story with uh, our movie that we did 12 cam, we designed an entire sequence in order to make the amount of shots for that day around lighting the sequence completely with a flashlight. And so my cinematographer went and found some fancy fucking flashlight 
that was a LED and we brought it to set. We had it all set up. It was beautiful. We did our first shot. He ran down the hallway. He was bouncing it off of boxes that will light his face as he did this thing. Then we go to shot two and then suddenly there's this weird flickering that's happening on the flashlight. And so we had to change batteries. It ended up costing us because the batteries were specialized for the day. It cost us almost as much as it cost to rent a grip truck to, to refuel this flashlight with batteries. But through that process of doing that, I had to scrap a whole lot of like really techie shots. And then at the end of the day, I had to sort of come back to what you're saying. I only have time for camera on sticks and a lens and I've got two actors. How do I change my plan in order to make the day? And what I end up doing is falling back on my early days, back when I was doing stuff in New York, where I just had three mounted lenses on an Aeroflex and that's it. And so if you, I know it may not be the sexiest route when you're starting out where you're like, I'd like to learn how to use a techno crane and do all this stuff. You need to understand it's like three fucking grand a day minimum for the techno crane guys. So why learn on that? Why not learn on the stuff that you're consistently going to have access to, to tell a great story and to, and to uh, convey your tone. And then when you want to play it around and you have that money, uh, if you don't necessarily know how to use that gear, there are a bunch of technicians that do you're still going to fall back on those skills of like a single lens kind of game, you know? Well, it also, I think the, the other thing is, is, you know, it's just a good sort of, you know, tip for younger filmmakers is like, I'm all about the, you make the most of what you have and you do it really, really good as opposed to like, so if you've got two days to shoot, not a great idea to have 10 locations. <laughs> yeah. it's, just, it's just, you're going to spend more time traveling from place to place. Mm -hmm. right then you are shooting so i realize that's a that's an extreme example but you you so if you know that you have limited resources there are ways to sort of craft your story a little bit with that in mind i'm not saying right to the budget right but you'd be crazy to try to do a two-day short film with 10 locations it would be ridiculous yeah you would, at <laughs> new york city where it takes you an hour to get from one area to the next right yeah. physically that will mean that you get so few shots of each thing and if that's what's important to you or other locations well you're going to sacrifice coverage the amount of shots you get you're going to mm -hmm. sacrifice performance because you won't be able to do it over and over again and mm -hmm. these are the decisions that you have to make and you know there's like with with uh quinton for example like that there's a reason why Reservoir Dogs takes place largely in a warehouse during the day. <laughs> okay. And there's one primary location because he knew that he would never have a lot of money to make this movie. So he wrote it daytime in an empty warehouse because he thought if, if I only can find two actors and no money, I'm going to shoot this thing myself in the backyard and I'm just going to do it. Mm -hmm. How much money I get will make it bring me that much more resources. But I'm writing this to be able to do for nothing. And because like, I don't, will I ever even have lights to be able to shoot at night? I don't know. So there's no scenes at night. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It's all during the day. Um, it, and it's what primarily one location and that, you know, uh, that creates a certain tension. Hateful Eight is not that dissimilar, mm -hmm. right? In terms of it, the use of the location, primary location. Um, now there's a lot of other stuff going on. You know, there's the storm, there's the this, there's the that. But that limitation can be, that quote unquote handicap can become your asset in terms of tension. Yep. You know, and that's just your choice in how you, how you tell, how you, tell the story, you know, and, and how you mine the material that you have. And so it's just like, you know, it is a reasonable thing to not have 10 locations in two days. Like it's just not a good idea. <laughs> it's true. And then here's the heartbreaking thing is that let's say that you do do your indie film and let's say that you do do your, uh, your short and uh, proof of concept and you get to the position where you're reading scripts and you're in this position right now that, that I'm in in Hollywood where I'm trying to get a couple horror movies made. Now the studios are like, this needs to be one location. <laughs> like this needs to be as cheap as fucking possible. 
um, you know, for, you know, for, you know, whatever sort of money that they're going to, the, the millions that they're going to try to attempt to make off of a two, three million dollar movie. And so now that's what they're all looking for is like self, like monster in a house, self-contained, uh, like very minimal cast, especially now during uh, coronavirus and COVID stuff, like having a, a, a cast of more than like five people is adds thousands and thousands of dollars to it. Yeah, and so it's just better to health wise to try to shoot outside. Yep. It just yep. is a, a, you know, it's just, it's a safer way to go. And so, you know, that scene that you, you know, in your, that you dreamed of would be these two people sitting in a parked car at night. Like, <laughs> you know, do you really want to shoot it like that? Or can they, can they, go for a walk? Could they be standing outside in an alley? Like you just, you want to do certain things to help you, um, to help you physically because it's so challenging to make a movie. Um, totally, man. And then, and then at the end of the day, you, I, for those of you that are in an edit room, you, you realize that the stuff that you thought was so important when you're on production and you're on set oftentimes isn't. And when you're, when you're cutting a sequence, you find the accidental moments. And at the end of the day, really, it's about the people that are in front of the camera. It's about the subject materials, about what they're talking about. Um, and you can make a million different combinations of that interesting. And well, so, and also, like, it is, it's, it's one of the reasons why when you're making a movie, some people prefer not to have the editor with them, um, mm -hmm. sitting there right next to them. Why? Because... When you go and watch dailies at night or you, you know, you're sitting in the editing, that shot that took you, that took all day to get, <laughs> just, these 17 things went wrong and the car broke and the this and the pain and suffering that you went through to get that shot. In the editing room, that shot's value is the same as the shot that you got by accident as an extra shot where someone turned on the camera a little too early. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. <laughs> so the, 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 it doesn't really matter that that location cost $10,000 or that location cost a hundred dollars. The value of the shots, the same in the editing room, it's mm -hmm. the shot. And if you know the pain and suffering through which you went through to get to physically get to that location or to get to that shot or to get, that shot has no more value. So like for a director and a producer, you're saying like, oh my God, we're going to cut that out. It took three weeks to get that. And now I'm going to throw it away. But <laughs> you have to. Yep. It doesn't have any more value because it was harder to get or more expensive. It just yep. doesn't. Yeah. And, and what you're hoping for with the editor is like a first stage towards the audience because the audience doesn't give a fuck. They just don't care. They don't oh. care. Everyone makes so much about like how much a movie costs. I don't know. Last time I checked, it costs the same to go see a movie. Whether that movie costs $2 million or $200 million, you're still paying $14 to see it. So what do you care how much it costs? Yeah, very true. <laughs> it's crazy how uh, we've become so obsessed with that. And I, why do you think that is? Why do you think everybody's so obsessed with budgets these days? I think it's just because it's when you hear this movie, you know, Cost one hundred and fifty million dollars. You just go like, oh my god, one hundred and fifty million dollars. Right, like right. it's so much money. Like, and then you watch it, you are like, yeah, it didn't look like one hundred and fifty million dollars to me. <laughs> but you watch like Reservoir Dogs cost a million and a half dollars, right? Right. And like, right. okay, but you are paying the same amount to see it as I just said. But like, it's it's the toys and the process, and it it's look, it's. It's the same thing if you go to see a house and someone tells you, like, you know, we built the house for next to nothing, and you walk in, or you go to see, like, cost us $15 million to build that house. You're mm -hmm. like, you're a little bit more curious how people spent the money to build something. Mm -hmm. Like, why did it cost that? What did you get? You know, and so for me, like, I go see these kind of, like, superhero movies and stuff, and I'm like, I, I, the spectacle is so fantastic that... <laughs> Or like these, like even like the Fast and Furious movies, like oh, oh my, my god. god, how did you do that? Like, how did that car go down that road and you do that shot with that drone over the this? And it was even second unit, and the director was like, it's crazy time. Like a James Bond movie, the locations. Oh my god, oh, dude! You no, know? and 
I love that stuff. Like it's fantastic spectacle shit. I love it. But ultimately, like it's eye candy and yeah. I, it's called candy for a reason. It tastes good. It just is a little bit empty calorically, you know? Yeah, it's you true. Know, I want the story, but boy, I like, you know, I love some spectacle, you know, <laughs> like why I, it's great to go to crazy places and, you know, like hateful eight, we sh- you know, you shoot this scene with on this bridge that like, we're not even really supposed to be on that's over this gorge. And it's like, we're going to do this shot from all the way back there. We're going to show and there's no visual effects. And like, it's really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's nice to hear you say that because, um, I think a lot of time you like, at least I think a lot of times with younger filmmakers, they're just like, the producers are all about money. The producers are all about, you know, making cash on this sort of thing. And, and I love to make movies because of the experience. Just like you said, you get to go to these crazy spots. You get to meet all these really wild people. You get to uh, experience uh, a bit of imagination brought to life. Like there's nothing better than walking through a set that's lit, you know, and you can just see it. And you're in that space for, for like a heartbeat. And you're like, somehow I'm in a, a different world for a heartbeat. And this is such a wonderful adventure. And, and, uh, I like to try to get my entire team feeling that way every time we do something. And, um, I love to work with people that feel that way too. And it's, it's, it's nice to, to get a glimpse at that passion you got in there, dude. Well, it, it, you know, for me, like I remember when I did, um, the movie, the cider house rolls, right. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, it's based on a novel by John Irving. Um, it's set in the 1940s. Um, it thematically is a story about sort of um, whose whose rules are you going to choose to live by you know the rules that someone hands you the rules that you make for yourself like that's what the movie's about Mm -hmm. but it also deals with abortion and adoption and racial issues and stuff and like the, the the concept of sort of like dreaming up this movie from the book with the writer for years working with that screenwriter to create this screenplay for years. Yeah. Right. And imagining this movie and, and we spent, you know, five years, just the writer and I working on the screenplay. And, and then finally we got Lasse Hallstrom to direct it. Then you get this actor, you get this money. And then all of a sudden you, you are able to go like, and I remember like the studio was like, maybe you should shoot it in, in, in Toronto. I'm like, no, I'm shooting in new England. It's set in New England. I'm shooting in Vermont and Massachusetts, and I'm not go- going to recreate New England landscape somewhere else. Like I want to shoot in New England, and if I have to, we have to shoot for a little bit, few less days for that. Then that's what we're going to do. Right? Mm-hmm. And I want to go to this beach in Maine that I always knew about. And yeah, it's going to cost us more money to go there for a week. But when that camera goes up over that dune and you see this beach that I I see it. I know it. Hmm. And it's a little extravagant. Okay. You could go to the beach near where the other place was, but it's just not going to pull. It's not going to have the same impact. The story in the story, the character tells you, I've never seen the ocean. Right. That's what he tells you. Yep. And then you're going to go show him the ocean. And when you, when that camera comes up over the dune and that character sees the ocean for the first time, you show that to the audience. And you're like, it, it's got to take your breath away. Exactly. It's not going to work. Yep. And like, I know that beach. It's in May. I know exactly where that beach is. And we're going there. And we're doing it right there. And it, yeah, it's a little extravagant, but it's going to be worth it. And it was. And it worked. Yeah. yeah. See, but it's, it's romantic. That's what I love about it. I mean, it's such a, our business is such a strange business because it is this, this like car crash collision of like art and finance. And there, uh, for me, it's all about the romance in there. You know what I mean? Like, sure. You want to make stuff that does well and you want to do movies that do well and that continue to make money for the people because you've asked them for money and you want to make sure that they get their money back. But then at the same token, if you do that, then you can continue to have a career. All that's important, but there's the romance of it. Like, casting people, finding people, like you said, like working with a writer for years, a lot of people don't realize that. It takes years to get something developed and put out. Like we're talking five, eight, 
So like Mad Max took what ten years with all the craziness that they had to go to um, for the new it, version of it. It, it. it can take a really long time, and sometimes it takes a short time. And look, we can romanticize it. Part of the the I think one of the reasons why for me it remains romantic like that is because it there's so much that is so unromantic and unsatisfying. Um, so basically when like to get to that beach, like the planes and the shitty hotel you had to stay in and the when we had to do it in the schedule and the, the motel six that we stayed in and the, the, the getting there, the waking up at four o'clock in the morning to go out there and you're standing there and it's freezing and you're like, Oh my God, the actors are going to have to pretend that it's warm, but it's freezing. And not, and then you have to like come up with the like, oh, she wraps herself in a blanket because because she was freezing, mm-hmm. and all these things. And you're standing out there, and you're freezing, and you're like standing there, and like this is so difficult, and you really are in the middle of nowhere, and like you just want a cup of coffee, but there is no coffee, and it's so hard. But in the end, you don't really remember all that stuff. I just remember the camera went over that dune, and you saw the beach, and in the end of the day. It's what's on the film, and that film will last forever. And you you created this from nothing. Yeah, and that is pretty pretty romantic. But it's also like any romance; it's the suffering that makes the romance so much better. <laughs> it is very true. <laughs> yeah, there is so much suffering, and when you're one of the people that are putting people through that suffering for that, sometimes you're like, "Man, I'm vicious," but it's worth it's worth it. You know, and at the end of the day, you're right. Like at the end of the day, when years go by and everybody forgets how cold it was on that beach and they put in that movie, they go, wow, fuck. That's really awesome. Okay. The grips bitched all day. Really? Yeah. This is where you want to go? Really? Like, like <laughs> and they just look at you every time they walk by with the gear and they're like, you asshole. <laughs> right? And I'm like, I know. Okay. And I, you have to endure that. And like, you just try to get soup out there for everybody because you know, and they're like, oh, great, you got me soup. What a nice guy. Okay. <laughs> and it's like, look, I'm trying. Okay. But in the end of the day, you know what? I, I stood out there too. And I was out there before you, and I was out there after you. Like, I'm never asking you to do anything that I didn't do. And you know what? It's worth it. So yeah. shut up. <laughs> I used to because a lot of my good buddies back at home uh, are in the unions and they're you know they're you know they're in the lighting department they're in the grid department they're all that stuff and they're a salty group because a lot of times for good reason they're, they're the guys that are out there trudging like heavy cable through mud and they're dealing with oftentimes like indecisive directors or cinematographers where it's just like really you want to fucking turn everything around right now after all the shit that we went through so I get that stuff but whenever my buddies start to bitch I'm like Guys, guys, I used to work as as a house painter and I used to work as an airplane mechanic and never during my job in the middle of the day did someone walk around with lobster tails ask me if I want one. <laughs> so it's yeah, just like, on. And it isn't, you know, the other thing is like this, you know, like I didn't know anyone that was in this business. It's not like I was, you know, born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Like my first job, I was feeding dog biscuits to dogs to make them stop barking so that the sound didn't hear the barking on a movie and they would just scream, location, shut that dog up and you'd have to run around the neighborhood with a pocket full of dog biscuits making your dog <laughs> cry, right? For $100 a week. <laughs> you know, well, you're kidding me. You're going to pay me $20 a day yes. and you're going to give me lunch and you're going to give me dog biscuits and that is my job. And I did that <laughs> for three months. Crazy. <laughs> and I... I I was about to say I was happy doing it. I wasn't happy doing it, but I was around the set of a movie and that's mm-hmm. all I wanted was to be around the set of a movie. And so, all right, I wasn't that close because I had to give the dog biscuits to the dog. <laughs> you, know, not my hand bitten off, you know, but you figure out you can stand really far away and you can launch the biscuits over the fence <laughs> and you still figure it out, you know? Yeah. Only in our business, man. <laughs> Only in our business. Well, you is someone clever enough to go? Hey, just hire a guy and give him a give him a handful of dog biscuits. Oh, man, the jobs that 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 are created for films sometimes are just incredibly hysterical. Exactly. 
Um, look, it's we're 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 approaching our time. How are you doing on time? Are you okay? I'm uh, coming to the end. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I got you, brother. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta run because I have another appointment. In a few minutes. Um, well, really quick, because Liam, Liam, are you still there, bud? Yep, I'm still here. Liam, did you have any? Liam, are, did we put you to sleep yet, or what? <laughs> no, not even close. Yeah, yeah. Well, because Liam is Liam is uh, he's the one that got you on the show. He's the one that introduced um, us together. So uh, thank you, Liam. And then Liam's also going to the school. So Liam, do you have any insights? Do you have any questions? Do you have anything you want to talk about? Um, look, his- you know, it, it, it's funny because a lot of the things that I'm talking about with my you know fellow classmates is exactly um, what we're talking about here. It's the fact that we we are very well aware that the jobs we're going to get immediately after graduating are not going to be the glamorous jobs that we're, uh, we're hoping to one day have. And I'm, I'm curious if, Richard, you have anything that it's like, what is, what is the reality of... I guess what is the reality, right? It's like we're going to we're going to film school and we're meeting all these great people, but we're going to go right into those jobs that we could have gotten out of undergrad or we could have gotten out of high school. And yes. I'm curious, it's like why why is education so important? I guess at this level. Because the people that you're doing this with, you wouldn't have met otherwise. Okay? And they're going to make you a better filmmaker. So you, you're not, yes, you're going to film school to get a job and have a career, but you could get, and yes, I agree 100%. You could get the same internship virtually out of high school that you could get coming out of an MFA degree program. And I've hired those interns and I never asked them if they went to film school or not. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're hundred percent right. However, okay. When I'm interviewing that intern, I didn't ask them if they went to film school, but you know what I asked them? What films have you seen recently? What do you like? Okay. Why'd you like that movie? Okay. And nine times out of 10, the person who went to film school is a more, is more articulate than the person who did. Okay. And the people that you've met along the way have informed your own sensibility to a degree that you wouldn't be able to inform if you didn't go to film school. So basically, like, I, I agree it doesn't put you in a position by virtue of what's on the piece of paper to get you the better job. But it has formed, hopefully, um, it, it has made you blossom as a human being and also given you a level of connections that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to get that puts you in a position to actually secure that job. Totally makes sense. Totally Lee, makes what, sense. What, what, which program are you in? I am in the producing track. Oh, very nice. And um, uh, where did you go to undergraduate school? I went to a small state school in Pennsylvania called Kutztown University of Pennsylvania. Um, but I was in the uh, cinema, television, and media production uh, major there. Uh-huh. And what movies have you seen recently that you really liked? Uh, Lost in La Mancha. I watched it last night and it was absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Okay. What else? Um, most recently, oh, see, now I'm going to, I'm going to be a horrible example because I'm blanking on it. A uh, taste of cherry was uh-huh. unbelievable. Iranian uh, I did director. get to watch it. I'm sorry. The Iranian director. Yes. yes. Abu mm-hmm. Kas. I can never say his name. Yeah, no, I'm not even going to attempt on uh, that's an excellent movie um, oh someone's imd being it as we speak i can hear <laughs> i am Liam. <laughs> i am that's my job my job is to look up these things and i cannot pronounce his name either and i apologize <laughs> hey, and, uh, and i'll know it what's uh, his name Abbas, is um, uh okay. kiarostami yeah kiarostami excellent director um and and how'd you find out about that movie uh, because I went to film school. <laughs> we had to watch it for our history of narrative film class. Right. Do you think that some of your friends who are just not going to film school have ever heard of Kurosami and Taste of Cherry and got to talk about it in school? No, I, I almost guarantee that 
that is not the case. All right. Dude, literally, I was going to be like, Liam, why are you looking? This is, this is very out of character. <laughs> uh, so it's interesting that you found out about those while taking the course and those were like required watches or were they suggested to you? Uh, they were, they were uh, uh, films that we were supposed to watch uh, to discuss in class. But mm-hmm. it's one of those things. I know lo- I've heard of Lost in La Mancha. I never had a reason to watch it. Mm-hmm. I now have a reason to watch it, and it's something that I'm going to go back to. Um, and the same with Taste of Cherry. Taste of Cherry was the kind of film that I would never go and find. But now that I found it, I want to return. Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Well, Richard, I don't want to take up your whole day, man. And uh, I really appreciate the conversation and I appreciate everything that you've shared with us. This has been a lot of fun. Did I lose him? Yeah, we lost him. Oh, my goodness. Stand by. Let's see if he comes back in the room. I hope he comes back in the room. (laughs) Yeah. Hold on a sec. Let's see if we can, Damn. If we can get him back in. Uh, I'm dead serious about that, too. Taste of Cherry was not one of my favorite films, but it absolutely challenged me. Yeah. And I think, well, I think dude, that was... It makes, I'm so sorry. I hit. I leaned on my computer, and I... I <laughs> <laughs> no worries, man. Not a worries at all. I'm I was so just... sorry. <laughs> I was just saying that uh, I didn't want to keep you. So I was in the process of going, hey, look, Richard, I don't want to keep you for much longer. I know you got a bunch of stuff to do. And then you were gone. I was like, whoa. (laughs) Exactly. Fuck you. No, just kidding. Um, (laughs) Uh, But look, uh, I appreciate uh, you being on the show with us, Richard, um, and sharing as much as you have. And um, uh, like I'm. I've loved all the movies that you've done and it's, it's very inspiring to hear how passionate you are about cinema. Um, and, uh, usually this is the part of the show where I ask our guests to sort of give a little bit of knowledge to the young listeners that we're listening to. And you've been giving knowledge the whole show. So I would say this, I would say if, if, uh, you are someone that's listening to the show and you, you want to be a producer, like ultimately you want to get into the part point of your life where you're making films, um, what would you say is the best path for them to take? I, I think the best path is to watch a lot of movies and read a lot of screenplays and educate yourself about material. Hmm. And then there's a whole host of jobs and it's the, our whole business is apprentice. You know, like I started out with the dog biscuit thing so, <laughs> or the mail room I worked in for a while. And basically like it's all apprentice kind of a business, but what, what you, you, you have to develop on your own, is watching and reading um, and that your own taste begins to you know sort of emerge so by watching um, lots of movies and reading lots of screenplays you will develop your own aesthetic and uh, Liam carry on the producing thing man and come say hello when you're when we're back in school you know come come in and say hi will you I absolutely will I really appreciate it a pleasure to talk to you guys. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Richard, for being on the show. My pleasure. Cheers. So there it is. Our first episode with a producer. I hope it lived up to all the expectations that I set up at the beginning of the episode. Liam, what did you think? Did you like this one? Oh, hell yeah. No, it was, it was awesome. Um, I was actually really excited to talk to Richard just from a, you know, a student perspective, Mm -hmm. but I'm really glad that we were able to do a whole deep dive into his career. I mean, he's had an an amazing career and it's also really interesting to hear the origins of it, you know, and how he (laughs) went from like feeding dogs biscuits, um, to like being part of like, uh, being one of the people that are looking for films and, and looking to acquire films and to make films and then finding Tarantino and, and like having that script sent to him. Um, and essentially, I mean, he's, he's being very modest about it, but dude, as a guy that's trying to get his movies made right now, and I know, I know I'm not, I've never been able to give you details. It's just cause I can't, 
But let me tell you, I, I've got a lot of shit ready to rock, and it's like a perfect storm. It's a perfect formula of things. And yes, we are in COVID times, and it makes it really difficult. But it's so hard, and it's really difficult as a first-time filmmaker. And Tarantino, no one knew who the fuck he was before Reservoir Dogs. He was, like he said, he was a video store clerk. And so for this guy to be one of the individuals that reads his script and helps make that happen and getting that initial financing, this is like the bane of our existence for those more, because uh, I, I know a lot of the guests of the show continue to listen to the show. And if you've made movies, you know that it's the same every time. It's that initial financing. And uh, I'm consistently running up against that too. First time filmmaker, mm, you know what I mean? So power to him for, uh, for making that happen. Um, and I hope you guys learned a lot about producing on this show. Like Liam, what did you learn? Was there anything new from you? Yeah, I, I learned about, I mean, like, again, I'm, I'm in school for this, right? And I'm at that school for this. And so we do have an emphasis on when you're watching things and you're reading things, keeping tone in mind and but but getting that deep dive into what it means when you're reading a script and what you should be looking for and also what you should be kind of like feeling for and that was that was huge that was eye-opening mm -hmm. that's a big part of it man that's that's most of their job is that acquisition it's finding that project to spend all this money and all this time on and he ain't he's not lying man it takes years when he says that he works for years with a writer We've been working for years on the rewrites for the 12KM and for Who's Their Features with our producers the same way. I mean, and they're very much involved. Not only are they giving advice on how much things cost and uh, how to find talent, but they're also giving their opinions on taste and tone, which is a big part of it. I wish I could tell you who we're working with because these guys are so fucking great. Anyway. Um, speaking of you going to school and you going cross country, Liam, mm -hmm. uh, I listened to your episode last week. Oh, so you were the one. <laughs> yeah. I listened to your show last week and I, you know, you're always learning something new about the people that are around you. You're always learning something new about your friends. Um, and I just didn't realize what a good fucking liar you are. <laughs> 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 uh, what, what, what do you mean? Yeah, uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, you lying about having a place before coming out here. I was concerned about that, you know. And you, you, <laughs> you're incredibly fortunate to have that foresight to be able to lie to me. Because if you were like, I don't have a place, I would have been like, don't even bother coming out. Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> That's I, why I, I, I fucking did it. That. Yeah, and because if I was on the show. I would have done this. I'm going to defend myself here. So <laughs> when, when Liam talks, if you haven't listened to the show, go back and listen to it. He does a good job. Uh, but uh, when you were talking about waiting for my responses and how quickly I responded to some things and how long it took me to respond to other things, mm -hmm. it's essentially because of this, you weren't a fucking priority. <laughs> it's at the end of the day, when you're dealing with these folks and if you're writing to people, like Liam says, if you're writing to people for internships and you're writing to people for help, be persistent, be incredibly persistent because here's what happens on my daily routine. And Liam, I drive him crazy with him all the time because I'm not often responding to his emails or his texts. What happens to me is I wake up with great intentions. Every morning I wake up with a good intention. I try to sit down and I make my to-do list, right? And I go, okay, here's the shit that I got to pull off for the week. Here's the shit that I got to pull off today. And I get started. And what always happens is that a phone call happens or someone asks me to sit down and render something out. Someone asks me to do something. And I'm like, yeah, that'll take like five minutes. And it takes like three fucking hours. And then the next thing you know, you've been up since eight o'clock in the morning and it's five o'clock or it's seven o'clock. Last night it was seven o'clock that I wrapped out and I'm like, fuck, I was supposed to call five people on the East Coast and I and now it's too late for me to do so. So look, I didn't respond to you quickly on those things because of that, that was the reasoning. It wasn't that you're, I wasn't interested in having here because obviously you're here, you're, you came here, you're part of the show. 
Um, but it's you just have to understand those things when you're reaching out. Like your intensity isn't the same as the other person's. Exactly, and I don't. I do want to make it very clear that I was aware of that. And the only reason I brought I brought it up is because a lot of people. I mean, I was not alone reaching out to people, and I was sitting there with a bunch of uh, of my classmates, and they're all getting frustrated, and I'm like. I'm doing something that there's no way in hell that there that you had a reason to say yes to me. Mm-hmm. There was no reason for you to be like, sure, I want you to travel fucking 45 hours to come here and work for free out of my living room. Like that 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 shouldn't have been a yes. And yet it became one much later than, you know, when I initially reached out. Mm-hmm. And that means that it's like just because you don't get a yes right off the bat and just because you're ignored, that doesn't mean that it's a no. Totally, totally. It doesn't mean that. And at the end of the day, you just get good at those skills because it, it consistently happens. I know it happens with us booking people on this fucking show. We have a philosophy here where it's like you bug them until they tell you to fuck off. Like it's, it's, it's that, it's the way with everything. Whether you're producing a movie and you're trying to get an actor on board, or you're trying to get to the actor's agent and the agent isn't responding to you and you're going back and forth with the agent. And people all the time are like, yes, we're interested. And then it's like two, two or three weeks later, I had my, and I'm not going to drop any names, but I had my producer in one of my films recently tell me, and here's a quote. He recently told me that I need to stop thinking with my filmmaker brain and I need to start thinking with my producer brain, which essentially meant pump the brakes because it's going to take a long time. And it just does. That's the, the nature of our business is that it takes a long time. And the reality of it is this. Even though it seems incredibly sexy and lucrative to work in this world, a lot of people are working in this business for free. And I don't mean just you guys. When you get signed by an agent or a management, they make percentage off of a project that you do. So until you do that project, they're fucking working for free. And if they believe in you enough, they're working working for you for free or with you for free for years making phone calls, setting up meetings, giving context, doing all this sort of stuff for years. And they don't get paid until you do. So that being said, you're dealing with people that are working for free. You're dealing with people that love to do these jobs and that are there to do these jobs. But at the same token, they have the real world shit where it's like, fuck, I got to make some money to be able to pay rent. I got to make some money to do this. I got to focus on the guy that's making me money right now because I haven't been making money for six months. And so keep that in mind when you're reaching out. So just because someone doesn't get back to you instantly doesn't necessarily mean that you're ugly, doesn't necessarily mean that they don't like your work, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you got bad breath. It probably means that they just got a lot of shit on their plate that they got to handle. And oftentimes we forget right? It ends up so low on that to-do list, or I put a coffee cup down on that to-do list and that, that line gets fucking destroyed. It just disappears. And more often than not, I have been very happy when people come back and remind me of things. The older I get, the harder it is to remember. Does that make sense, Liam? Yeah, I forgot what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought you did a good job on last week's episode running solo there you're getting better yeah you know we're having fun yeah it was fun um i'm trying to think of what else that uh was surprising me about that show look man like power to you and i I hope that everybody is inspired by the balls that you had to reach out and then to move yourself cross country and then you were fantastic out here. You threw yourself into it. You helped change the show and the path of the show. Um, and then, unfortunately, you had to fucking work from a quarantine fucking apartment out here. Um, but uh, congrats, man, for all that stuff. Thanks. I will say that, oh, you know, I'm hearing feedback, so this is really annoying. Um, hold on. I'm going to try to move some stuff. This is awful. Uh, what I will say is that, like, when I was there, it wasn't just, you know, sitting and working on the show. Because obviously, exactly what you're saying, 
there are points where we got to figure out, you know, how to how to get money for food. So it's like you were able to offer me a bunch of other opportunities that it wasn't just the podcast. And when I'm communicating with a bunch of people from home, they were doing the same thing over and over and over again every single week. You know, it's it's same shit, different day. Mm -hmm. And it felt like every day that I walked in, there was something brand new that I was working on, whether it was that music video or setting up, you know, um, uh, the Puget stuff, or if it's, you know, just finding new, uh, new people to get on the podcast. And that's, I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. And I, dude, I, I, that was my philosophy in general. We talked about that earlier on was like, I can offer you experience. And what I can try to do is give you a uh, real life experience and real operating experience. And now collectively with the experiences that you're getting from schooling, uh, you'll have a pretty rounded, um, history behind you so that when someone asks you to do something or you tell someone to do something, then you know what the fuck you're talking about. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you know what? It pisses me off because I didn't think about it when we were on the show with Richard, but I will say one of the coolest movies that I've seen, uh, since I, uh, I, w I went to school was a girl walks alone, a uh, girl walks home alone at night. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it like to anybody listening, this is a film it's, I believe it's another Iranian film, but it, it definitely is not an American film. And it is one of the coolest uh, uh, vampire films that I've ever seen. It is a cool vampire movie. And I'm surprised that, uh, that you're listing that one. What, how did you see? Why did you see that one? It was, it was one of the things that we were supposed to watch for class. Ah, yeah, no, it's a crazy yeah. movie, man. It's a fun movie. Um, I think that was, I'm looking it up right now. Who produced that movie? Yes. I know exactly who produced that movie. That's SpectraVision. Yep. And we've had some people on the show that have worked with SpectraVision. And mm -hmm. I don't know. They just keep coming up with uh, knockout hits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so crazy how I keep mentioning that company. Huh. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, well, dude, like I said, thanks for setting up this episode. I think it was a good one. I hope you guys at home enjoyed it. We're not going to ramble on. Let's wrap this thing up. Um, stay tuned. We got a bunch of great shows on the horizon. Uh, we're planning a bunch of big episodes uh, and it's going to get weird. So strap yourselves in, guys and girls, because it isn't just going to be filmmaking stuff going off the grid with some of these new episodes and uh, hopefully they'll get you uh, thinking harder about how certain jobs are done hopefully they'll get you thinking a little bit harder about how ridiculous some of the people that run this country are and maybe you'll learn something fun and new and be inspired uh, so that way when you get out of this COVID craziness you're off and running alright Liam so uh, thanks for being on the show buddy yeah, thanks for having me today. Okay, guys, and you know the deal. I will see you next Tuesday.